Now that I'm almost at the end, I'm just going to do my 10 picks of plain weave. But while I do that, I wanted to chat with you about a couple of things that I think are important, um, things that I've found along the way with this project. Uh, the first thing is that the yarn does shed quite a bit. So it gets quite fluffy as I'm weaving it. This is the mandala warp that I'm talking about. And it does um, shed off quite a few fibers. This is worth knowing for a couple of reasons. Well, the first thing is I was getting it all over my clothes. So I've put my weaving apron on now, so I'm okay. Um, but the other thing is if you have allergies or any kind of respiratory problems, um, yarn that sheds could be a problem for you. So I wanna make you aware of that. The second thing is that this yarn is quite a bit stretchier than I planned for. So I did weave my 70 inches for the scarf, but what I found is that I had heaps of warp left over. And I thought maybe that's because the yarn has stretched more. And therefore when I take it off the loom, it may shrink back a little more than I thought it might. So to counteract that, I wove an extra seven inches, which is 10%, um, an extra 10% of the length of the scarf. So I'm, I'm thinking that that will probably make a difference. Now, um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, so now I'm weaving my 10 picks of plain weave at the end. And then I'm going to do my hem stitch. I wanted to chat to you about the hem stitch as well. To let you know the different options that you have. This is the ninth pick and 10th. Finishing on the right hand side, which is just what I want for my hem stitch. All right, so I'll just pop into neutral while I measure out my hem stitching yarn, which should be around four lengths, the width of this project. So let's measure that one, two, three, four, a little bit extra. Never hurts to have a little bit extra. Now, um, two options for hem stitching here. You could either do what I'm gonna do and hem stitch from this end and you sort of hem stitch backwards. And, or you could, depending on whether your loom's on a stand or whatever it is, take it off the stand and turn it right around and just hem stitch like you did at the beginning because that part of the weaving will be in front of you and closer to you than it is to the reed if that makes sense. But for me, I'm gonna go backwards. So it's easy and quick for me to do. I'm gonna start with my locking stitch at the edge. Um, and I'm just gonna show you a really little bit of this because I do have another video that I'm going to link to that is called hem stitching the other end. Because I've already made that video, I might as well just get you to pop over and watch that. Um, so you'll remember that we were doing four warp threads across and two weft threads deep, which means I'm coming up here. Then I'll go back to the start underneath. Make sure that I go underneath that weft yarn, that tail or my working yarn, whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to cinch that in to a group. I'll go down next to that on the left-hand side of the group that I just made. I'm going to count one, two, three, four warp threads across, and then I'll count in two weft threads and come up there. This is eliminating a step, um, making a, a little bit quicker I show you how to do that in the other hem stitching video as well, if you're going to be using that. And of course, if you decide to turn your loom around and hem stitch that way, then I will also link below to my regular hem stitching video for using the loom in that straight position. Whichever way you decide to do it, you're going to get the same results. So. It's just a matter of preference, whether you want to turn your loom around. I certainly did that. I actually did that for years. Um, 
before I experimented and found that I could do it backwards pretty easily and um, that I didn't have to move the loom. I could just start and I thought, wow, that's a bit easier. Okay, so just keep working your way across and make sure that you check out the links for those other videos that I mentioned. I'll meet you back here when I've finished my hem stitching, when I've gotten to the other side. And then we're just going to have a quick look at twisting the fringe for those of you who want to twist your fringe. And then after that, we've got the wet finish and the drying, and then your scarf will be done. All right, all ready to take off the loom. So I'm gonna loosen off my tension, take my stick out. And where I'm going to cut my warp is important because I want to have that leftover for the fringes. I still have a bit of warp left here, but I'm not going to need all of that. But I can just cut, roll it forward a little bit and cut nice long fringes. Take off my front brake and can start unrolling the scarf. Now you get to see how lovely the underside is as well. I just let all my cardboard separators drop. I'll fix them up later on when I'm cleaning up when the project's actually finished. Take my separators out and then I want to undo these knots rather than cut them because I need that extra length for the fringe. Now you don't have to have a rotary mat and cutter and all of these things that I've got, but I just use them because I happen to have them. I actually bought these for other projects for quilting and that sort of thing but they've been very handy for doing things like this. If you don't have those kind of tools don't worry the aim here is to fold your scarf in half lengthways and to get the two ends a bit equal so line that up with the other end as best you can Yep, and then we want to tease those fringes out just so that we can cut them to a similar length. Whether you're going to twist your fringe or not, you'd still want to do this step. This is part of getting what looks more professional as a finish for your fringe, is having both ends quite equal. Now, if I didn't have the tools that I've got, I could easily come in with a good pair of scissors. You want nice sharp scissors. I could see where the, one of the fringes ends and then just cut them both to the same length. But I am going to use my rotary cutter and my ruler. And I'm going to bring that out to a line. Let's see, I think I can push it to about there. And I've got my scarf all lined up with the squares on the mat. So then I can just take my cutter along. And then I can tease that out again because often there are some little strays in there that you didn't get the first time. That might cause a bit of unevenness. This is actually not looking too bad. They all look like they're pretty even. Maybe a couple, couple of longer ones there. Um, okay, so I'll pretend that I'm a perfectionist, which I'm absolutely not, <laughs> just for the sake of looking professional and come in and do those a little bit extra. Uh, but realistically, unless I was selling the scarf, I would normally leave that kind of thing. Okay, so now we're ready to twist that fringe. At this point, you want to be laying out the front of your scarf 
and you'll want to have a couple of heavy books or just one heavy book depending on how heavy it is but you want it heavy enough so that the scarf's not going to slip around on you while you're trying to twist the fringe and it also doesn't matter which side of the scarf you do the twisting on um, so I've got the underside facing up at the moment but it doesn't matter it's no different um, so let's see when I'm thinking about my grouping um, and I hadn't decided on this yet but I'd better make a decision now otherwise this demonstration is not going much further but here's a couple of things that I could do with my grouping um, I could because they're in groups of four I could twist this group of four on its own and this group of four on its own and then twist those two together okay so that'd be like a little bit of a thicker fringe or if I wanted to go finer I could divide these into two um, and twist those and then twist those together and so I do the same over here twist those together to have those kind of separate groups of four fringes hmm it's a tough decision but I think I'm going to try twisting them in groups of four and then twisting those two together what I might do is I might do these first two bunches first um, and then if I don't like it if I think it's a bit too thick I can always undo it now I do also have already made a video on fringe twisting or how to use a fringe twister and I'll leave that link down below in addition to what I'm doing here um, that'll go into a bit more depth than what I'm doing here so I'm going to twist those two up together so normally I would be using all four prongs but because I'm just testing out seeing what I think I'll just do those ones for a start knot them up I'm just going to knot it fairly lightly okay so that would be that would be the width of all of the bunches and I'd have two groups of four joined together coming coming across and together like that all the way across so I'd have I'd have fewer twists I'd have slightly chunkier twists as well and I think that's what I'm going to go with if you don't like the look of it if you think it's too thick then um, you might want to do what I suggested before and, and divide them into groups of two rather than groups of four and of course if you don't have a fringe twister and you don't want to go to the trouble of twisting your fringe by hand which I completely understand why you wouldn't want to do that I know that some people do it it's very admirable but I don't really have the patience for that kind of thing when there are terrific tools like this available um, but whatever you decide to do with your fringe you you decide at this point before the wet finish um, so if you're deciding to actually just leave the fringe as it is like this um, then that's what you would do and you would go on to the next step of the wet finish another option for your fringe could be to just braid by hand that can look really nice it's a little bit similar to a twisted fringe in the look um, so you could divide up what would you divide you'd have to divide I think in groups of three because you need three strands for doing a braid um, so you'd have to rather than dividing a group of four into three it would probably work better to divide them up like this and then just to start braiding either you could do it a loose braid like this is a fairly loose one that I'm doing right here or you could do it a bit tighter depending on what you wanted to do and a braid is it doesn't take too long but it's effective because it shows all the colors mingling together which is really pretty and it also protects the fringe so if I leave my fringe just completely raw like this uh, over time it's probably going to get a bit ratty especially as it has washes and that sort of thing so you may want to do something like this so that's what the braid looks like in case you're wondering as compared to the twists quite it's quite a similar thing 
up to you. Of course I'm going to undo my braid now because I can't have one braid through all of these twists. It won't look right. Hmm, that would be another idea I guess is to do a combination of braids and twists. Now any of the tools that I have used in this class, throughout this class, um, things like fringe twisters and all of the bits and pieces that I've used, they will all be linked in the blog post that contains the pattern. If you need to have a look at things, see whether it's worth you investing in any extra equipment or if you're just curious to sort of price things, see how much they cost, whether they'd be worth it for you and that kind of thing. If you go to that post, you should find all of the things linked there. Okay, so I will keep going. And once I've finished this end, of course, I need to turn the scarf around and do the exact same to the other end. And you want to do the exact same, whatever you've decided to do with your fringe, you want to do the exact same on both ends because both ends will be showing um, when the person is wearing it. And it won't look right if, you, if your groupings are different on either end or whatever, if the thicknesses are different, you want it all to look pretty much the same and pretty uniform. Okay, so I will meet you once I've finished doing all of my fringe twisting and then we can talk about the wet finish. Okay, so my fringe is all twisted up and I do really like the way it looks. It's a little bit chunkier than I would normally go for, but I think it really works for this kind of scarf. And you remember how I was saying initially that I wanted to have the fringe colors kind of lead your eye up into the warp and I think having them chunkier like this really does that. Um, so there's just one one more little step that I'm going to finish off with for my fringes Once I have twisted them you can see that you know some One group might have a little bit more twist in it than the other and then you have these sort of straggly ends because they're not Just the same length anymore. So what I like to do is I just like to comb them out with my fingers do a little pinch and then cut so that they're all the same length and then the idea is for each bunch that I'm cutting, I want it to be a similar length to the last one. Now while I'm doing this, I can chat to you about the wet finish. I was going to film the wet finish, but it's really getting very dark here and I know that it wouldn't make for a very good video. And in addition to that, I have another wet finishing video to direct you to. So in a way, I don't see too much sense in making the same instructions over and over and over when I can just direct you to the wet finish video. So for this one, I've got um, a different type of weft to my warp. Remember the warp is the Mandala acrylic and my weft, I used a super wash wool. Now I'm not particularly concerned about their rates of shrinkage. I know that they're probably going to be slightly different, but the reason that I chose the superwash wool is so that it wouldn't be shrinking too much um, and doing something wacky with the acrylic. And so I'm going to do a gentle wet finish, pretty much like I do in the video with some warm water and a mild detergent, and I'm not gonna agitate at all. Now I know that some people think that I'm a bit overzealous with my wet finishing, but you know, I have to say, I don't do the same type of wet finish for every single product that I make. It really depends on the product and the yarn that I've used. And because I have the two differing types of yarn, I'd rather err on the side of caution. One time someone left me a lovely comment on YouTube saying that it was absolutely ridiculous, my method for wet finishing and basically told me that my video was trash. Um, that is my wet finishing video. That's fine if someone doesn't like my method for wet finishing, they can use their own method. But I'm just saying that this works for me and I think it will work really well for this project as well. A comparison would be, say if I had um, some kitchen towels that I'd made 
with cotton, then I chuck them in the washing machine on a hot wash. I would never do that to something like this. I'm a lot more careful with something like this because I'd rather be careful and have my piece turn out beautiful after I've spent all this time weaving it than um, throw it in the wash or beat it around or whatever it is other people do and have it shrink on me or have it pucker or have the colors fade or any of these things that could potentially happen. So anyway, that's my reasoning behind it. And also my disclaimer is no one has to do things the way that I do it. All I'm doing on this entire channel all the time is showing you what I do and what works for me. I'm not saying to anyone that you must do what I do. That's just my way of trying to help. All right, so I've got nearly all of these trimmed and it really does make a difference to trim them off like this at the end. Oh, I need to mention this too. This is kind of important. So um, in a perfect world, I would have designed this and figured out all of the mathematics so that I had completely equal twisted bunches of fringe at the end. But being an imperfect world with an imperfect person such as myself, I found that at the end, I only had one bunch left instead of the two that I was using for all of the other twisted fringes. So all I did at the end was I divided the bunch into half, so two threads in each bunch, twisted them together and twisted that up. Now, yes, that is visibly different to the other bunches, but I think when it's being worn, it's really not going to stand out a whole lot. So I'm not concerned about it. And people can criticize me for being so imprecise if they want to, but that's how I roll. So check out the link for the wet finishing video and you can wet finish your scarf at this point. With the tails or the little weft tails that you have, leave them until the scarf is completely dry after being wet finished. And then you can cut them close to the fabric. So here's a quick look of how the scarf is in its what we call loom state, just off the loom, um, no wet finishing. And this is the, this is actually the front side that we wove. Um, I like both sides. This side will appeal to you if you like a lot of texture. And this side will appeal to you if you like a bit more color. I actually really like this side. And I'm really happy with the progression of colors, the way they've gone across. And I'm also happy that I have enough of this mandala yarn to weave another scarf. Thank you so much for joining me for this free project for 2021. I'm so glad that so many of you could follow along and I hope what results is some really beautiful scarves that make a difference to someone in your life or a difference to you yourself. If you enjoyed this project, I would love for you to share, to share the videos with your friends, the more the merrier in my opinion. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Until next time friends, happy weaving.